here we are again. It is Math with Marty. Well, boys and girls, uh, Marty doesn't have uh, much of a topic worked out for you today because I got so many uh, ideas for topics just buzzing around in my head and I just can't uh, bring myself to narrow them down. And uh, then it turns out there's unfinished business from previous programs that we gotta, we've got to discuss. I know you're all very interested in how the peace plan is making out and it turns out the Middle East peace plan isn't doing all that good. Um, the Jews were not uh, wildly enthusiastic about giving up half of Israel and uh, the Palestinians, well, you see, Ramadan ended just uh, the other night, and uh, some of the guys in engineering, I loaned them the tape, and they all got together and viewed the tape, and uh, the response there was, again, not the overwhelmingly favorable. Um, and uh, it, seems like, uh, it seems like we're not all that close to sort of achieving the diplomatic breakthrough that we were hoping for. Um, I still, in my opinion, it was still a good peace plan. And we'll just for those who were not lucky enough to see it, we'll, we'll just remind you how it went. And the idea of the peace plan was that we tried to avoid getting into questions of right and wrong and who did this to who and who massacred what guys, you know, 40 years ago. Because it turns out that our people and their people have different perspectives on the historical facts. And I've realized that no more that I am able to convince them of my version of history than would they be able to convince me of their version of history. So I said, the question is, were we just going to keep fighting, which were both sides willing to do, or would we make some kind of division? And the one I proposed had certain amount of territorial shifts and certain shifts of population, but basically those guys got a fairly decent piece of territory, like so, and uh, we uh, got the rest of it. And uh, to make this work, we had to do some pretty serious shifts of population where there was large pockets of Arabs here, which we would say should probably move over there large numbers of Jews up here which should come in here and then we could maybe have a division of land but uh, both sides uh, seem quite intent on uh, keeping uh, basically the whole country for themselves and uh, that's where it stands at uh, present and we're still hoping to get some further further uh, participation maybe some representatives from the other side coming on to the show and say what they think of it but the peace plan, as I report, is, uh, seems to be dying rather quickly, and uh, most people are saying uh, good riddance from both sides for opposite reasons. And that sort of shows you something about the way, the way things are going down there. Well, you had said when you originally presented the plan that you, ex you wanted a plan which would be equally unacceptable to both sides. So I guess the plan is a success in that sense. But I'm wondering if you can share with us um, some of the objections that, uh, that you heard from your Palestinian friends, um, if you heard explicitly objections they had. Well, most of the students that I see regularly who, who are Arabs are um, Egyptian or Lebanese. They're not the Palestinians. The Palestinians are in another section, so I only know them indirectly. But uh, they the guys I talk to are seriously interested in, in the idea of some kind of division, but at first glance they look at it and say it's so small. And of course the Jews look at it and say we're giving away the whole country. So it seems to be largely a matter of expectations. And uh, both sides, of course, have a substantial share of hardcore extremists who will prefer to fight for the whole land than give up a share of part of the land. And I'm trying to be non-judgmental and not say that there's more extremists on one side than the other because I'm really not sure, sure that there are. I know which side I'm in sympathetic to, but I'm trying to uh, keep some kind of objectivity on this. Anyhow, we've, we're trying to avoid making the show uh, 
uh, late night uh, uh, world news with uh, math with Marty. So let's get back to math because this is just this is just sort of an aside. And what we uh, we had this uh, question last time where we suggested that a Mercator projection of the worlds has certain geometrical properties. This is the map projection, which you see, which you see in every classroom where there's a big map of the world. And uh, how do we start? Let us start with Alaska. And then we come down here, and there's a map of the world, and there's Mexico, and there's South America, and uh, there's Brazil. I'm not doing very good today. And there's the map, and there's Florida, and there's there's the map, and there's Greenland, Hudson Bay, a bunch of islands, and there's Greenland, and Iceland, England, Ireland, France, Spain, etc., Mediterranean Sea, forgot Italy, and uh, Africa. And I really don't need to draw this whole map, do I? But I can't, I can't stop once I get going. I just can't stop it. <laughs> so we'll just keep going until we got the whole miserable world. You see, this is what they did object to, the use of the word uh, miserable um, in association with certain countries of the world, which is not really intended in an insulting way, but it's sort of an honest expression of the fact that our people are not overly fond of their countries after 40 years of war and recognize that they are not overly fond of Israel and that if peace is to be made, it must be made between countries who do have some animosity towards each other. But as far as, you know, the people, I, I really like the people from those countries, but, but they, they did not like uh, that adjective applied to their countries, understandably. Let's draw the rest of these, these countries. Man, it takes me longer and longer to draw this stupid thing all the time. And there's a lot of countries in there. Okay, let's just wrap it up. Japan, Philippines, Australia, New Guinea, etc. And there we go. Now, the Mercator projection, we lay out the lines of latitude and longitude. And there's the equator. And then you have your lines of the prime meridian and numerous other illustrious lines of latitude and lines of longitude. But the way they set it up, is the lines go from 0 to 30, and then from 30 to 60, and then from 60, well, they never quite make it to 90. They go like to 70, 80, and the 90th latitude just keeps getting farther and farther away. And as a consequence of this, continents like Greenland, because these latitude lines are getting stretched out more and more, become swelled up in size far out of proportion to their actual square mileage. So you see Greenland compares favorably to South America which is not really reality. So why do people use this projection? And it is basically these Dutch or Portuguese navigators 500 years ago who were geniuses and who weren't afraid to go out at night with nothing but the stars and a little primitive compass to guide them and sail across the seven seas. And they use this projection because it's favorable properties of directions when plotted on this map are true directions. If I draw this line, which intersects a meridian at 45 degrees, like so, on the Mercator projection, that line is going northwest, which is exactly 45 degrees northwest. And on other kinds of map projections, which may do a better job of keeping things in their right size relationship to each other, angular relationships such as this are not correctly preserved. A consequence of these angular relationships being preserved, by the way, is that an island such as, well, way up north here, we have the Spitsbergen Islands, which will draw like so. And they are far out of size in terms of how big they should be. But if they were reduced to their correct size, which might be only that big, they would still be the same shape. They didn't get screwed up in shape, only in size. Whereas other kinds of map projections, um, this might get bent and twisted, whereas it wouldn't be swelled up so much. Uh, how can they preserve shape if, as you get closer to 90 degrees, 
The thing starts growing like crazy this way, but just it gets limited how much it can grow that way. The preservation sh of shape is a little bit of a subtle point. Of course, something that is very large and spans numerous degrees of latitude will be distorted. If something is a square island uh, or that goes very near the North Pole, that, or that although it was square, as it gets near the North Pole, it will be swelled up like that, so it's no longer square. Okay, I'll draw that again for the guys on the camera. Yeah, see, this could have started out as square, and then it got swelled up into a shape like that, which is nowhere near square. But a very tiny region within there, such as this, which might have started as square, this, which is square here, actually did originate as a square. And squares which are over here, which are sort of square, but they did originate as squares. And the, the real distortion is only over a, a shape which, which, uh, which covers a wide range of, of latitudes, whereas locally the shapes are not distorted. This is a little bit of a subtle point. However, the preservation of angles, I think, is an exact relationship. So we can deal with it that way. Anyhow, I suggested uh, when I gave the problem that the Mercator projection resulted from, uh, from uh, taking a, a cylinder and putting a globe inside the cylinder and a light bulb at the center of the globe and shining the light bulb out. And where the continents cast their shadows on the cylinder, that's where they'd be, and then you'd unzip the cylinder. And uh, when I did the calculation, I gave it as a problem. I did the calculation, and it turned out that this projection with the light bulb did not have the property of preserving shapes. In fact, I, I did a special case where I took a little square region near the 60th latitude and figured out what it would do under projection by a light bulb, and it turned out it, it got uh, distorted into uh, something that was twice as long as it was high. So the shapes clearly were not getting preserved. And I wonder how could I have uh, been wrong? So I looked up in the Encyclopedia Britannica, and it said something like this. It says, the Mercator projection, it says the cylindrical projection of the globe is used where you have a cylinder wrapped around a globe, and for example, you might shine a light bulb and cast a shadow, and that would be your projection. Then they say, the best known example of a cylindrical projection is the Mercator projection. So, I mean, you would conclude reading it that this was the Mercator projection, but they don't actually come out and say that this is the Mercator projection. But the distinction is so subtle that anyone who read it would come away with that impression, I guess. And then I asked around people who are in the mathematical areas, and some people didn't know how to define a Mercator projection, but I met a couple of other people who had the same misimpression as me that it could be defined by this... Uh, geometrical kind of mapping. And it turns out this is not true. The Mercator mapping is done purely mathematically. And uh, immediately following uh, the broadcast of last week's show, um, Professor Swift at the University of Manitoba sat down and uh, did the calculation which gives the actual function which mathematically generates the Mercator projection. And it's a very nice analysis. And I think I got it. I think I got it here. And let's have a little look at what 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 we what he's done here, because uh, it's quite good. Quite good. Now he's taken uh, the circle and wrapped wrapped it in a cylinder. And uh, he's taken a projection from the origin that goes through the 60th and the 65th parallel. And instead of doing what we did, which is to continue going straight up like that, he's taken it that the projection has to bend downwards, like so. And then he's written as a mathematical formula the condition of how it should bend. He says that, uh, and this is the analysis we did on the show when we proved that it was the wrong projection that we formerly had. 
He said you took the sine of the angle, which we call theta, and the sine of the angle corresponds to this distance. So the latitude, the 60th latitude, which is actually half, the sine of 60 degrees is one half. So you got half the distance here, so you've stretched, since the cylinder is still this wide, you've stretched the thing by a factor of two, therefore you should stretch this by a factor of two. So we call this distance uh, here, we call it delta y. And this distance here, between 60 and 65, we call it delta theta. And uh, the condition is that the stretching in the y direction, compared to what we had on the, the lines of latitude, had to be equal to the stretching of the sine theta. And if we write the equation, it is delta y over delta theta equals sine theta. No, no, we've done it wrong. It is 1 over sine theta. Now, we bring the delta theta up on this side to get the theta terms on the same side as each other. And now we have the change in y equals the change in theta divided by sine theta. And here, what you do is integration to bring these out and I really cannot get into the theory of what integration is at this time but Professor Swift has done it and he gets y equals now to integrate 1 over sine theta he is telling us that uh, cos theta y cos theta he's integrated 1 over cos theta Okay, okay, it's cos theta, okay, it's cos theta. Sorry, sorry. That's cos theta. It is cos theta. Should have been cosine. She was cosine all along, okay. And to integrate cos theta, he comes up with the logarithm of one plus sine theta over cos theta. And uh, now to check that this function does what he wants it to do, he has actually taken the actual distance between the 60th and 65th parallel and uh, put it into this formula and got a certain uh, stretching that he wants to get on his calculator and compared it to the amount of stretching that he got uh, of the lines of uh, latitude which is 1 over cos theta, and it actually checked out as a number. And uh, I think that's uh, tremendous. And in recognition of this, we decided that uh, Professor Swift should be, should be entered in uh, the grand prize draw, which we're going to be holding later this year, for uh, the winner of the Math with Marty. Um, well, we were going to have a t-shirt draw, but we didn't have a t-shirt, but, uh, but we we do have the math with Marty underwear. So, uh, and they, these things really uh, glitter, glitter in the dark. I've, I've tried them. And uh, we know you'll all be looking forward to that. So, uh, on that happy note, I think we should, uh, we should proceed to uh, the organ and see what kind of song we got, to, we got to fire up here. You got one for us, Neil? No, sir. No, I'm responsible for the song. Yeah, that's right. Um, have, uh, have you got the amplifier fired up? No, I don't. Just let me okay. hit the switch. Let's see what happens. Now, we've, uh, I've got some new sounds programmed into my synthesizer here. I'm quite excited about some of the organ effects that I'm able to get now. I think, I don't know if uh, you will love them at home, but, uh, to me, the one I got in here now makes me... Oh, it's just like I'm uh, Tom Ralston on the Lawrence on the Lawrence Welk show because whoops let's let's try this song I 
can hear the rooster crowing. It's a frosty morning. I can almost see the sign. Going so fast, I can't stop. I'm just a stone's throw from Little Rock. Heading for that Missouri line. You don't need a map to get there. You can get there from anywhere. When you're going. Just like the day I was leaving, it's been oh so many years. Let me get on the Frisco Silver Dollar Line. Take my time, see what I can see. the short version because because uh, we got the five minute flag and I thought we'd do a math question and I didn't think uh, didn't think we'd stretch that out for the whole remaining five minutes so uh, basically what we're now responsible for is uh, given a problem for the people to work on next week and uh, let's take this stuff off the board Have I got a problem? We all know I don't have a problem. The guys uh, in the studio showed me a dandy uh, math trick done by David Copperfield on a recent magic show. And uh, we thought we'd do an analysis of it, but we didn't really have time to prepare, so we're going to save that for later. But here's, uh, here's a problem which uh, has come up, and if you haven't seen it before, you should try it. There are four ants located on the corners of a square. Man, it's hard to draw a square. The older it's I get... It's fine, it's fine. Okay, okay, it's good enough. And what the ants do, this one is looking at this one. I guess you could say this is a boy, and this is a girl ant, and this is a boy, and this is a girl, to give some purpose to the, to the question. We say that the boy is looking at this girl and he's chasing her, while this girl is chasing this boy, and that this boy is chasing uh, this girl, and this girl is chasing this boy. Now, we say they're 12 inches apart, and uh, that they move with a velocity of one inch per second. So it's 12 inches. And they're going one inch per second. And uh, how long does it take before they all get together and have a real good time? <laughs> and that is your problem for this week. Uh, and that uh, does bring us near the end of the show. We're going to head over to the, the musical part of the studio for one last crack at uh, the instruments here. Um, we are sorely feeling uh, the downturn in the musical quality of the show since 
Sharon left the show to pursue her studies in architecture at, uh, in Europe. However, in accordance with our responsibility to continue bringing you the best in music, we are going to do what we can. Bobby Helms, 1962. Still love you. You are my. 